Good evening. I want to share some scripture with you tonight. One of my favorite is Psalms 90. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction. And say us, return, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, as a watch in the night. Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as a sleep in the morning. They are like grass that groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withereth. For we are consumed by thine anger. By thy wrath are we troubled. Thou set our iniquities before thee our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. If by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. It is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so it is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy. Do we rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Let thy work appear unto thy servants, thy glory unto their children. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. Particularly, I want to mention here, uh, verse 10, The days of our years are three score and ten. If by reason of strength they be four score, yet in their strength is labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off, and we fly away. By the grace of God, just a couple of weeks ago, on May 22nd, I lived to be three score and ten, so I'm now 70 years old. And it's been quite a journey. Wouldn't take nothing for my journey, as they say. I don't know how many more I have ahead of me, but... I'm inclined to believe the best is yet to come. Another uh, verse here that I think is quite significant, and verse 12, so teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And to me, that has to do with proper use of our time. Ever since at least my teen years, and certainly in my 20s, I recognize the idea of the stewardship of time. Too often we think of stewardship strictly in terms of money. I believe in tithing. I believe in giving 10%. I believe in responsible use of our finances, but I believe there's more to it than that. I believe that God expects us to use not only our money, but our time, our talents, our abilities, and everything for his glory. God has a plan for everybody, as I've been preaching for years. Uh, God has a plan for each and every life. Uh, some people fit into that plan better than others. Only Jesus fulfilled the plan to the T. And unfortunately, there are people who don't even try. But as I've looked upon the past and, and seen, you know, where we were then, where we are today, it's just been a lot of, uh, it's been quite a journey. I was born on May 22nd, 1951 in Waco, Texas. And Waco, like any other place, has got its good points and its bad points. 
my ministry has taken me to a lot of different towns, all in Texas. I always consider Waco home. I graduated from Waco High in 1969, then received an associate in arts degree from McLennan Community College, MCC, in 1971. And then I received a bachelor's degree in religion and sociology from Baylor University, some call it Jerusalem on the Brazos, in 1973. I continued uh, to attend Baylor, attending graduate school there. I received a Master of Arts degree in Church State Studies, which takes in religion, history, and political science. I had a lot of good experiences. I learned a lot at Baylor. That was not all the time I spent there, and I'll get to that in a minute. Had various jobs, you know, starting out sacking groceries at, at HEB when I was in high school, and did a number of other things as I was coming along. But my first professional position was with what was then called the Texas Department of Public Welfare, which is now known as Health and Human Services in Teague. Teague is in Freestone County, about 54 miles from Waco. On December 2nd, 1974, I got in my car and drove from Waco to Teague. Never been there. I didn't know a soul in Freestone County. I was a social worker for the aged, blind, and disabled. And I... I worked there for a little over two years. It didn't take me long to get acquainted. I had clients all over Freestone County. And also had my first experience at, at, at workaholism. At least for the first six months, I totally immersed myself in my job. I, when I got the caseload, it was not in very good shape. And so it took a lot of work to get it up to par. And I was visiting clients. I was uh, conducting interviews. I was taking notes, writing reports, filling out forms, all the paperwork the state required. But I uh, got totally immersed in it, and I loved it. I did some other things on the side. Uh, see, keep in mind, I wasn't pastoring a church at the time. I was... Uh, was not married. The main things I had going on was my job and my master's thesis. I had completed the coursework at Baylor in May of 1974 and got my prospectus approved for my master's thesis, which was entitled The Nation of Islam, Belief and Practice in Light of the American Constitutional Principle of Religious Liberty. I joined the Rotary Club in Teague. I was already uh, an active mason, visited most of the lodges in the area. I was not pastoring at the time, but I preached at various churches whenever I had the opportunity. My first uh, pastoral experience occurred at Whitney, but it didn't last long. I was pastor there at the Whitney Missionary Baptist Church from, um, from June the 18th, uh, 1972 to January the 14th, 1973. Uh, not quite seven months, but it was a very eventful seven months, to say the least. And the summer of 1973, I spent working in Virginia. I was recruited at Baylor for Southwestern Company, a publishing company that uh, they send college students out to sell books door to door. I sold uh, Bibles and other books. Uh, it was uh, quite an experience and very hard work, 75 to 80 hours a week, straight commission. It's not for everybody, but it is for the chosen few. The Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. And, but that, uh, in 1974, let's say December, I went to work in Teague. And it, uh, when I first started the job, I had a responsibility to provide social services to residents of various nursing homes, as well as setting up in-home care, what we call alternate care. 
also known at the time as Homemaker and Shore Services. And I, uh, one of the nurse, one of the nursing homes I served was the Fairview Manor Nursing Center in Fairfield. Fairfield is the county seat of Freestone County, uh, 10 miles from, from Teague. And there was a nurse working there by the name of Deborah Bass. She didn't like me at first. I would come in there when it was inconvenient times. I needed to review the charts. And uh, she said I talked too much. Talked about stuff unrelated to the job. You know, kept her from her work. She hated to see me come. Well... Nearly two years later, Deborah was a patient at Fair, uh, Fairfield Memorial Hospital. And back in those days before they had HIPAA laws, you could put out uh, names and addresses, not addresses, names and religious preference of patients uh, in full view of everybody. And you can't do that now. But a lot of times I had clients who were in the hospital that I'd go visit. And I went to, uh, well, I saw the name of someone that I knew while visiting uh, the client. I had to go see that other person. I knew Deborah Bass as a, a nurse at Fairview Manor. Well, we had not one visit, but several visits, some quite lengthy and some enjoyable conversation. And then after she was discharged from the hospital, she wanted to send me a card of thanks for my visits, but she didn't have my address. Finally, she called information and got my phone number and one night got me on the phone to say thanks for uh, my hospital visits. A few days later, I called her back and asked her if she'd have dinner with me. And she agreed. And during the next four months, we spent a lot of time together. On October 21st, 1976, we had our first meal together, our first date. It was at Winkler's Restaurant in Fairfield, which is now called Ponty's Diner. And we spent a lot of time together. And then on Christmas Day, I proposed marriage to Deborah and she accepted. On February 19th, 1977, Deborah Bass became Deborah Uzzle. So we've been married now for 44 years so far. Um, shortly after our marriage, we moved to Dallas. And the time I was pastor of Emmanuel Amy Church, I got appointed there in September of 1976 by the late Bishop John Hurst Adams. And I served that church three years. I still continue to work for the state. By the way, I've never been a full-time pastor. I've always had to have other uh, employment either as a social worker or later as a teacher and I worked uh, well, this had state jobs in Fort Worth later in Dallas then in October of 1979 I was moved to Macedonia Amy Church Kaufman it took us a while to relocate. We ended up moving to Kaufman. And by the way, uh, when I met Deborah, she had three children. Erica was six, Eric was four, and Joanna was two. I never will forget that uh, shortly after I moved to Kaufman, she went to visit a friend of hers, a lady belonged to our church, and she At the time, Joanna had been enrolled in kindergarten, and she said, I feel so good I got my last child enrolled in school. 
Well, about a week or so later, she went to the doctor, and guess what? She was pregnant. <laughs> On June the 12th, 1981, Robert Elton Nuzzle was born. And uh, I had a job in Dallas for the Department of Public Welfare. Well, by then it was Human Resources, later Human Services. But on April the 15th of, uh, I mean, April. April 20th of 1981, I started work at Terrell State Hospital as a case worker, a psychiatric facility. I, uh, I worked at Terrell for five years. And when I reached the age of 35, I felt it was now or never. I wanted to go back and get my doctorate. I was accepted into Baylor's PhD program. I didn't get the kind of support from the church that I was hoping to get. Uh, the bishop at the time wrote me a letter of recommendation, but as far as he claimed he didn't have anything available in Waco, and uh, it was a frustrating period for a while, but eventually, you know, I was able to start working down there. I started working at Paul Quinn College, which was then located in Waco and also had a graduate assistantship at Baylor, so that brought some income. In August of 1987, I gave up the church in Kaufman, but by then Erica was a senior in high school. And any parent can tell you that senior year is not a good time to move, so the family ended up staying in Kaufman for another year while Erica was graduating. And May of 1988, she and her future husband, Kenneth Prox, both graduated from Kaufman High School. And that August, uh, August 21st, we moved to Waco. And we, uh, I was teaching full time at Paul Quinn and going to school at Baylor each semester, gaining more credits toward my doctorate. I was decided not to pastor for a while so I could devote my time to teaching and my doctoral studies. Well, in 1990, Paul Quinn decided to move to Dallas and talk about something inconvenient. Man. Um, we, uh, I was totally against the move. Bishop College had closed in bankruptcy in 1988, and Comer Cottrell, owner of Proline Corporation in Dallas, convinced the Board of Trustees to move the school. So, it was very difficult. Uh, for two years, I had commuted um, between Kaufman and Waco. Then there was a two-year interlude. I didn't have to commute at all. Then, here we go again. At the time I met people for the first time, I'd always tell them that I'm, I teach at Paul Quinn College and I'm working on my PhD in Baylor. For some reason, they remembered the first but forgot the second. And it just, it was aggravating when people wanted to know, was I going to move to Dallas? And I'd say, I can't do that because I'm working on my PhD at Baylor at this time. I didn't know that. I told them that, but they forgot. Had we moved to Dallas, I would have had driven back to Waco three days a week for class. There was no way we could move. And so, little by little, we managed to pursue the goals that were ahead of us. And uh, on August 21st of 1991, with a great deal of difficulty, finally was able to meet the foreign language requirement, Hebrew and French. Uh, languages are not my forte, but I had passed everything, and so I was able to start the second half of my classes total of 48 hours, and so I was down to 24, and I got 
uh, got through with my classes, my coursework in December of 1992. Then I spent most of the year 1993 in studying for prelims. That's the exams that uh, you have to take and uh, over the various classes you've had. That's the last thing before the dissertation. 1993, by the way, was also the year that put Waco on the map with all international publicity related to the Branch Davidians, a local spinoff of the Seventh-day Adventist, about which I've done a lot of research. And I've done some videos about them before. But in September of 1993, praise the Lord, I passed all my prelims and I had the official title of ABD, all but dissertation. And in December 1993, I prepared uh, and submitted to the religion faculty a prospectus of a dissertation on Eliphas Levy, whose real name was Alphonse Louis Constant, a French uh, Roman Catholic who took a Jewish pen name to write about the Kabbalah and other esoteric traditions. Initially, the dissertation was not approved. It wasn't rejected either. Uh, I had to develop the prospectus more, and uh, there was not any meeting held in January of 94, but it was, it did happen on February the 7th, 1994. The religion faculty uh, did meet, and uh, Dr. John Johnson, my dissertation director, told him, urged him to approve it, so tomorrow was the man's birthday. February 8, 1810 was the date of Levy's birth, and Dr. Johnson had a great deal of enthusiasm about the subject. He was very helpful, as was a second reader, Dr. James Kennedy, under whom I'd studied Hebrew, and uh, Dr. James Wood, director of the J.M. Dawson Institute of Church State Studies, the same program which I had in my master's degree. Well, uh, I got my dissertation prospectus approved, and it was about this time, well, I think it was in April, I got a delightful letter from the United Negro College Fund. I was teaching at Paul Quinn. They granted me a $30,000 faculty improvement grant, allowing me to take uh, a leave of absence in order to devote myself to full-time research on my dissertation. It's what they call a sabbatical. And that was truly a blessing not to have to work, but have income and being able to devote myself full time to my studies. Uh, it's doctoral research. And anyway, it was, um, was granted an extension because they want you to finish the program within eight years. I had started in 1986, and so uh, I was at the eight-year mark. Uh, the rules are, at least they were at the time, that in order to grant a one-year extension, you have to have all your classwork completed and have passed prelims and submitted the first chapter of your dissertation to your academic advisor and their director. And then in order to get a second one-year extension, which is the, the max that they allow, you have to the director has got to certify that the substance of the dissertation is complete. I didn't have to do that, thank God. But I was then able to move full speed ahead. And uh, so I, by May of 1995, I had my dissertation completed. And on May, May 13th, I was able to March, receive my doctoral hood and to receive my diploma, getting a PhD in world religions. That day was doubly special because our oldest daughter, Erica, she had interesting course her life had taken. I mentioned earlier she had 
graduated from Kaufman High School in 1988. Well, she spent three semesters at Navarro College in Corsicana. Then in spring of 1990, she came back to Waco and did one semester at MCC. All her credits transferred, so she got her associate degree. We were very proud of that. And then the first year Paul Quinn was in Dallas, she lived in the dormitory. That year, uh, when they occupied the old Bishop campus, we were stepping over paint cans and everything else and going to class. I never will forget that. Uh, but then she came back to Waco, Erica did, and spent some, took more classes at MCC. And then she finally decided to go to Baylor. And then by May of 1995, she was completing her BA degree from Baylor, so we were able to march together, and that was uh, doubly special for our family. You know, always treasure that fact. So anyway, uh, in the fall of 1995, I returned to the faculty of Paul Quinn College. I was greatly disappointed by what happened after, at that point because Uh, in the spring of 94, I had been uh, one of the speakers at a program on campus in which I announced that I had received a, been approved for this UNCF Faculty Improvement Grant and got a round of applause. And there were some of the same people who were there. Well, no, what are you doing now? They thought I'd resign because I'd been gone for a year. I made it very clear I'll be back uh, to teach next year. I got my um, contract in the mail. I was getting paid, but I had trouble figuring out my duties because I wasn't scheduled to teach any classes. Uh, something didn't go right. And there didn't seem to be much support for continuing the religion major. So that was a very frustrating period. Plus, I didn't get my old apartment back. And I told the bishop we had at the time I was ready to return to uh, the pastoral ministry and was told that he didn't have anything open. If May 13th was the high point of the year, November 18th was the low point, I drove from Waco to Greenville, Texas for the state planning meeting and didn't receive a church. I was so devastated. Um, I thought I'd be welcomed back with open arms, but I was instead rebuked for having gotten out of line. I learned the hard way that get out of line is hard to get back. And I won't make that mistake again. But it was it was not until November of 1996 that I finally was able to return to the pastoral ministry. I uh, went to the Blooming Grove Maypole Circuit. Plans were being made. We're going to move from Waco to Waxahachie because that had put us about halfway between the two churches in Air Paul Quinn. Looked like a very good plan, but it didn't materialize because President Paul Quinn at the time decided to fire me. So he didn't need the religion major, didn't leave me. And told me, oh, I was, that was one of the most devastating experiences of my life. And I found out that uh, it wouldn't have been so bad. You leave one job, go to another, but I couldn't find another one. And I was got repeated refusal from various search committees and was told that we've had over 100 applications for this position. Um, there's, uh, we're down to a list of finalists. Your name is not on the list. And uh, it uh, went through all kinds of rejections. One uh, letter said, your credentials are impressive, but they don't match our current needs. It became very clear that supply and demand was not favorable to me at all. And a lot of places that having a PhD in world religions didn't count. And so it was a very frustrating experience. For the next five years, I did various things uh, to make a living. I had various part-time adjunct positions. I finally was able to come back to Paul Quinn in 2002 uh, by the way, in 1999, I was moved from the Blooming Grove Maypole Circuit to 
um, Forest Hill in Fort Worth. We'd eventually had moved to Dallas and uh, I stayed at Forest Hill three years and then in 2002 I was also moved to Wayman Chapel Amy Church in Ennis and that turned out to be my longest pastor and I stayed at Ennis 14 years and I was in and out of Paul Quinn they don't have tenure and I'm not going to say too much about that or we'd be here all night so uh, it's just that that's just been a very important very frustrating and very disappointing experience. A school you dearly love, you devote your, give so much to, and then they do you like that. And it's, uh, it's very difficult to maintain. You know, I was over, I was there for off and on for nearly 20 years. And I've taught at a number of um, community colleges. I was advised to go back in school, get a second master's in political science uh, by a former administrator of Navarro College. Well, I did that. I went back to UTA. 2008, I got MA in political science from UTA, so University of Texas at Arlington. My student loan skyrocketed, and I remained part-time. Since then, I've been interviewed three times for positions at Navarro College, full-time positions, but each time someone else has been selected. I've also taught quite a bit at Cedar Valley College and part of the Dallas College, uh, what used to be called the Dallas Community College District. And I was interviewed by them in 2012, but again, somebody else got the job. And so I haven't been, uh, uh, I've taught it uh, one time at Mountain View in Dallas. Uh, I taught Hill College in Burleson. I've taught, uh, one six weeks summer school at Temple College. Uh, I've been in a lot of different uh, community colleges part time, but schools really use adjunct faculty and not pay benefits, and that's been been pretty difficult. And last year or so with the pandemic, it's made it even more difficult. Well, um, we served. We moved in two thousand five. Deborah and I did to. Um, Ennis by the kid that time the kids were grown and on their own we had grandchildren come along we've got great grands now then in uh, on May 26 20 well let me back up a bit in November 19th of uh, 2016 I was reassigned from Wayman Chapel Ennis to Bethel Amy Church Corsicana and so we've been there for nearly five years. We hope to remain there until 2026 when I reach the age of 75. And that's the mandatory retirement age in the AME Church. And we have uh, had a very traumatic experience occur on when well, we moved to course Canon 2018 and 28 20 on November 24th 2019 our son Robert Elton Nuzzle was found dead in his apartment at the time he was a student at the University of Texas at Dallas he was 38 years old he died of natural causes he had uh, this coming well not this coming but yeah it is this it's coming Saturday, June the 12th, he would have been 40 years old. And so we really miss him very much. Um, Deborah has worked as a nurse currently. Uh, She's retired. She's had various health issues that make work difficult. In recent years, she's been able to do some private duty nursing. Right now, she's on a walker. It makes a lot of that more difficult. But perhaps after having some more surgery she needs, she might be able to return at least part-time. We don't know at the present. Um, this year... 
I have returned to Terrell State Hospital where I formerly was employed back in the 1980s. I'm not a paid staff member, but I'm undergoing uh, what's called clinical pastoral education, CPE, to gain credit and experience to become a, a chaplain, which is what I wish to do following my retirement from the pastoral ministry in 2026. I go to Terrell a couple of days a week. and. There are a few people left, not too many, but that were there when I was there back in the 1980s. In the meantime, God has blessed me to, with a lot of literary experience, I was able to um, over the years publish a lot of magazine and newspaper articles. And I have four books out so far in 2002 my book, Blind Lemon Jefferson, His Life, His Death, and His, his Legacy, which is the life story of a Texas blues man from Wortham, Texas, was published. And then two years later, Prince Hall, Free, Freemasonry in the Lone Star State from CUNY to Curtis, 1875 to 2003. And 2006, my doctoral dissertation at Baylor was adapted for publication Alpha Slavy and the Kabbalah, the Masonic and French connection of the American mystery tradition. Then in 2015, my book, The Durhams of Fairfield, an African American genealogy, was finally published. It took nearly 40 years to research. When Deborah and I got married, Alex Haley's roots was very popular, and I was determined to do what he did. And I traced her family to an African named Gobby who was a slave in Fairfield County, South Carolina. His descendants came with their masters to DeSoto Parish, Louisiana, and they were living near Fairfield, Texas after the Civil War. Fairfield is the county seat of Freestone County. In 2015, when my book came out, I had a number of book signings and lectures I delivered. Uh, on February 28th of that year, I spoke before the uh, Freestone County Genealogical Society at their meeting was held at uh, the Teague Civic Center. And that center is right across the street from the apartment where I lived during the two years that I was living in Teague. And um, that apartment has been a subject to dreams down through the years. And in my opening remarks, I mentioned that fact that I've had a number of dreams that I never totally moved out of there. And I said I can imagine the past due rent uh, accumulated after 40 years would be quite, <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, anyway, the newspaper story about my speech uh, correctly stated that I began my career in Teague in 1974 and am now pl planning to retire in Freestone County. Uh, Deborah's mother, Aldessa, is, uh, is now 87. She'll be 88 in September, and she lives out in the country outside of Fairfield, and Deborah's brother, bu brothers Buck and Charles live not far from her. There's some land that will be ours, and uh, had it surveyed, and in uh, the near future, I hope to have it cleared, and we plan to put a modular home there, and we plan to live there when we retire from the church in 2026. My plans, if my, we live and the Lord say the same, health, health holds up to be able to continue to do research and writing. I'm currently working on an autobiography and do chaplaincy work and also preach at various churches when that time comes. Uh, still have quite an interest in the lodge work as well, and so we'll just, just wait and see. But it's been a good journey. There's been disappointments and frustrations along the years. There's been ups and downs like any life. But I do thank God that on May 22nd of this year, I live to be three score and ten. 
I've tried to number my days to apply my heart unto wisdom. I've tried to manage time properly. My time management's not been the best in the world. Uh, again, what is proper use of time and improper, we find a lot of difference of opinion on that. But um, stewardship of time remains something that I really emphasize and always will. But three score and ten, these are my reflections on the life God has given me so far. Hope everybody has a wonderful day. God bless each and every one of you.